Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, so patient of you um, to allow me to have this um, luxurious amount of time to discuss this book. Now, I want to turn from the technical to the strategic, okay? So here is where I am likely to lose some friends, but I, I do wish to be straight with you. I've described the transactions. I've talked about the four categories of harms. My question is, how does this happen? Why does it happen? Who makes these decisions? And then finally, how can we fix this prospectively? So I wanna to talk to you now for a few minutes about regulatory lapses. First, I would like to start with regulators' unreadiness. That regulators, and I mean commissions, have checklists instead of visions. I know um, George, the first George Bush, what's this vision thing? Well, I'll explain. You see, the merger statutes tend to say only that the merger shall be consistent with the public interest. And so they grant, the statutes grant to the state commissions and grant to FERC vast discretion over defining that public interest. What is the public interest in mergers? Well, if you look to commission decisions, well, I've looked and I have yet to find a commission that has actually defined the public interest in terms of a vision. Well, what do I mean when I say vision? I've underscored it here. Enforceable expectations for the types of services that we want in the state. Are you going green? Are you going to nuclear? Are you going to microgrids? Are you going to break up the old vertically integrated companies and have more competition? What's your expectation for the type of service that you want? What is your expectation for the type of businesses that can produce those services? What are your expectations for the financial structures of those businesses? What's your expectations for the market structure? Do you want a monopoly market structure or do you want a competitive market structure? If I'm a state commissioner, I would wanna wake up every day with a vision for the way I would like the industry to look. Now I know everybody likes the unseen hand, but do we understand that we are in a monopoly market? So there's no such thing as competitive forces, truly competitive forces, establishing this vision. That's what regulators are there for, to determine the type of performance they want. So what I've said in the book, and I, I base this on my analysis of orders and statutes, that commissions don't have visions, they have checklists. So you go to the DC Commission's a statute, the DC Commission's orders, same with the Kansas Commission, the Maryland Commission, and all other states that I've testified in or talked to commissioners or advised. And there's a checklist. We have to look at the effect on rates. We have to look at the effect on reliability, on competition, on shareholders, on consumers, on the environment and jobs. It's a good checklist, but it's not a standard. There's no vision. And so the result is that when you have commissions with only checklists, instead of public purposes, the merger applicants can file an application where they're checking off the boxes and pursuing their private purposes. So we start with that problem of what I call unreadiness of a set of checklists without a, a vision. Now, we don't have time for the detail, but there was a time when there was a vision. Now, please don't run your cell phones. I'm not saying bring back the 1935 Act, but I'm giving it as an example of a vision. Back in the 1930s, there were only 13 holding companies controlling hundreds of utilities. Looks a lot like it does today. Um, there were various abuses, most of which are not occurring today. As I said, there have been no disasters, but I think there's been a slow leak of efficiency and an increase in risks of uh, customer harm and a diversion of value from customers to shareholders. So Congress passed this Public Utility Holding Company Act. Its central principle was companies should be local, subject to alert state regulation, consist of interconnected parts or parts that are capable of interconnection, conservatively financed, locally governed. That's our vision for the industry. Like it or lump it, ladies and gentlemen, it's a vision. And there's nothing that prevents a state today from having a vision, they don't. Now, the Holding Company Act got repealed. Um, full disclosure, I spent 20 years, the first time I testified against repeal, was in 1982. I remember going to the Senate to testify in 2002, re re realizing that I had first done this 20 years before. All right, full disclosure, 1982, I was in law school. I was reading an expert's testimony because he was sick that day. 
Uh, but later in life, in the late 80s and 90s, I testified as an expert, not against repeal per se, but again, well, against total repeal in favor of modernization. Anyway, Holding Company Act repealed, no more vision, followed by 50 states of regulatory silence. No state replaced the national vision with their own vision. And you will not find a lawyer who disagrees with the following statement. Holding Company Act repeal was not legally preemptive. States are free to have their own vision. Nobody created one. So that's the unreadiness. Now, again, I am not talking evil here. Look, I benefit from capitalism. I've got a lot of money in the stock market. That's how I can afford the work that I do today. In this context of regulators' unreadiness is the promoter's strategy. And that strategy is to frame mergers as simple, as positive, as inevitable. compatible with the public interest, normal, public spirited. They talk of what the transaction brings. It brings the headquarters building in downtown Baltimore. It brings the $100 in uh, a refund to all customers. It brings the trails that somebody wanted built in uh, somewhere in rural Maryland. Oh, it brings a grant to the uh, a housing organization that wants to help low-income uh, people. I'm big on helping low-income people, but I don't think it's the regulator's job. I think that's the legislators job. They shouldn't palm that off on the regulators. The regulators should tell legislators when there's going to be a problem that low income people experience. But it's up to the legislators to fix the problem of poverty. So they talk about what the transaction brings, not what it removes. You won't see a merger application that says, we're buying control at a premium that the target shareholders get to keep, even though the premium has value that was created by government and by captive customers. They describe the merger as inevitable. Hey, everybody else is doing it, so we have to do it. They distract attention from the merger's private pecuniary purpose with all the short-term offers. And I've been on the receiving end of this. It's part of the deal. When you go to testify, they frame merger opponents as anti-benefit, anti-business, where obstacles to the natural industry evolution. I hope I've made clear a position. I hope I've persuaded some of you that there's nothing natural about an industry evolution whose roots are in non-competitive markets, whose shape was designed by government for reasons other than advancing competition. And of course, they maintain time pressure. There's a lot of take it or leave it um, talk in these things. If you don't get us our merger by a certain uh, date, um, we're going to lose, you're going to lose all the benefits. You're going to be responsible for depriving customers of that hundred dollars. And so it's not hey, take all the time you need to get the right answer. It's don't let regulatory delays kill the deal. Now, I want to be clear. It's proper for statutes to put a time limit on regulatory decision-making. The question is whether that time limit is sufficient and whether regulators have the uh, resources to do it. So that's the promoter's strategy. And how do regulators respond? I apologize for the bluntness, uh, but I was raised in New Jersey. And I hope um, that I'm saying this, um, uh, again, politely, if, if if bluntly, and that is that regulators respond, in my view, by seeding leadership, by underestimating the negatives, and by accepting minor positives. I want to avoid a repetition here, but what do I mean by seeding leadership to the applicants? Well, again, how do the applicants frame this transaction as simple and positive? And commissions tend to start by viewing it that way. Again, they don't view it as a transfer of the government-created franchise for gain, they view it as, oh, these people are coming and they're going to bring us something. They don't view it as, well, what's the transaction that we're precluding by uh, considering this one? They just look at the thing that we have before us. Some commissions actually advocate for the transaction by trying to fix it uh, with conditions. I do think um, there's an underestimation of the conflicts that I talked about before. I won't repeat those, but I, I have yet to see a commission decision that is straight about the private public conflict. Again, I want to be fair, um, especially to commissions that I've appeared before, like the Maryland Commission and the DC Commission. You read the, you read the DC Commission's order and there was a slew of conditions. In fact, in fact, I don't know if the members of the DC Commission are on, but I have appendix three in my book is a five page single spaced word for word um, photocopy, not photocopy, but copy 
of um, one of the conditions in the DC Commission's approval of the uh, Exelon Pepco merger uh, concerning uh, what's called ring fencing. So there are some excellent things that commissions have done, but again, I argue that they have focused on avoiding harm rather than maximizing benefits. And I do think that there is a failure to recognize that, well, now that Exelon has bought uh, Pepco, it can buy anybody else. I mean, when the Connecticut Commission approved uh, Iberdrola's um, acquisition of United Illuminating, I was a witness for the consumer advocate in that case, uh, opposing the merger. Did the Connecticut Commission think about whether Iberdrola would next be acquiring public service in Mexico? Does it matter? We could argue about whether it matters, but let's have that argument in the case. And I would testify about that. I would say, you have no control once this uh, acquisition occurs over what they acquire next. Does that matter? And I've yet to see a commission actually address that question. So that's my concern about how regulators respond. I've already talked about the accepting the minor positives. Now, Carl, I don't have time for this today. This is the part which um, I found most fascinating. As I was working my way through this, I sort of got to chapter 10 and I said, okay, I've been part of this whole thing. Um, I've been watching this happen for 30 years. I think I can explain to the reader um, all of the incentives, but can I explain to the reader what it is about the regulator's mindset that causes them to make what I think are errors of logic and errors of law? Again, if somebody wants to come back and say mergers are great, I'm going to have to accept that there are different points of view. Um, again, Carl, without getting into the details, I have vastly benefited by reading the work of the behavioral economists. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, Richard Thaler, uh, Amos Tversky. All right, I haven't read the actual scholarly papers. I've read the layperson's versions of them. Marvelous three books that I've cited in uh, my book. And I will argue that there's a passion gap first. The passion gap, again, as exemplified by the maximizing return versus no harm. And that passion gap leads to deference. There are mental shortcuts, and this is where the behavioral economists come in. They talk about system one and system two, automatic thinking versus effortful thinking. All right, I'll take a second to discuss this, uh, Carl. The, um, the uh, Kahneman talks about this system one that operates automatically, two plus two equals four. System two is the effortful system. Effortful system, what's 17 times 25? You gotta stop. Well, system one has an offspring. What you see is all there is, okay? Why siati? What you see is all there is. It's our tendency, and this isn't every human being. It's not a problem that only regulators have. I've got it. It is our tendency to ignore the possibility that critical evidence is missing. And I argue that the applicant strategy is to keep the system one in control, to keep it looking easy. Hempling comes along and, com and complicates it. I want to complicate it because it is complicated, and that's going to cause the regulator to think with effort and understand things. But the strategy is to keep the system one in control. And so in the book, I talk about this series of systematic errors. No time to get into them today, uh, Carl. But in, in total, um, I think that this is there is a sum of unreadiness, the promoter strategy um, relating to that unreadiness, the way regulators respond, and possibly explain by passion gaps and mental shortcuts. Yes, six commissions did say no. California in 1991, Arizona in 2005, Montana 2007, Hawaii 2016, Texas 2017, Washington State uh, 2019. These are out of the 80 or 85 or so mergers, the only times where a commission has said no. Other mergers have been withdrawn because of conditions, but these are the only times that commission said no. True to my New Jersey upbringing, I couldn't let it go. I have critiques of each of these six because I still feel that none of them expressed a positive vision. They kicked the merger to the curb because of its harms, but they still left themselves open to a merger in the future that might not be optimal. With that, Carl, I'll turn it over to you for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, it's, it's seeming like we, we're going to need to uh, figure out a venue to have you uh, go into more depth. But right now, let's, let's get to some of the questions. Um, 
why why do you think that economists and and legal uh, advisors don't raise the net benefits issue as you have uh, presented during the briefing to the commissioners? I I don't have an answer to that question, Carl. You know, um, when I've advised regulators to have a merger policy, which is the context in which that question would arise, um, Carl, I've gotten two answers. One is we have a merger pending, so we can't talk about it. And the other is we have no merger pending, so we don't care about it. And in other words, I think there's a problem of inattention. I think there's overwork. I think there's a resource problem. Um, it's why I talk about the word unreadiness. I, I can't explain it um, other than that. Well, I think the other thing I would say is knock on the door of any public service commission and ask the front desk, send me to the person who's professional responsibility in this organization is to think about mergers and to be ready with a merger policy. And I truly doubt that you will find a place where there is that person. And so I think that institutionally, there hasn't been in the educational infrastructure for commissioners and uh, staff, that emphasis. I mean, what's cool for people today? Green. And then rate cases, right? Historically, now you know this because your history is very similar to mine in terms of when it got out of the biz, the most powerful people in regulatory agencies were who? The accountants and lawyers, because accountants knew where the dollars were, that's rate cases, and lawyers knew how to bitch and moan about the dollars because that's rate cases. And you didn't really have an infrastructure within the commissions where people thought to think about this. 80 murders later, we're still dealing with it, Carl. So I don't have a satisfactory answer. So many of the remaining questions are more general. So why don't we proceed with your fourth section, then we'll, we'll deal with questions on that and then and finish up with the more general questions. All right, Carl, thank you. Um, again, um, it's, it's, it's so, such a luxury for me and a privilege to have this opportunity to speak to such a distinguished audience and to have this time to do it. So part four of the book, Carl, is about solutions. And I've divided this into two categories. Um, one is posture and practice, and the other is infrastructure. I'll be very brief um, because I think these concepts are, are obvious. So when I talk about regulatory posture and practice, what I mean is less instinct, more analysis, less reactivity, more preparation, less system one, more system two. What have we got here? Start with a vision. Again, identify the mix and quality of services that customers need and want. Describe the types of companies most able to provide those services cost-effectively. Determine the market structure, competition or monopoly, most suitable to attract and maintain those companies. Start with a vision. If you don't have that, I think you are lunch for the transactions that come before you. Then hold a contest to get the best suppliers. Maybe you're happy with utility. If you're happy with utility, then, then tell the world, we don't need any mergers. No, thank you. We're not open for business. Otherwise, hold a contest. That way you're shaping the investors, the executives, and the workers and centers so that the merged company produces that mix and quality cost effectively. It's a very long story, but very briefly, I just spent a good part of last year advising or being on a team of advisors to the South Carolina Department of Administration on running a competition for the possible acquisition of the state-owned utility, Santee Cooper. I can't get into the um, details of it. I can't even get into, I won't get into the pros and cons, but the fact is I was lucky to be part of an incredibly high quality team of M&A experts and contract experts and industry experts um, that actually tried to plot out the way a competition might be uh, set up. At this point, um, a, a comp a, a, there was no outcome uh, in terms of changing things, but that's the first step, hold a contest Understand what your must-haves are, understand what your must-not-haves are, understand your discretionary haves, okay? And establish screens for company types. If you don't want a Spanish holy company, say so. By the way, I got nothing against the Spaniards, okay? I'm just saying, if you don't want an external, if you don't want somebody who's running the company from a long distance, if you don't want a conglomerate, if you do want one of those things, have screens, have preferences, have a vision, have a position, have selection criteria, 
instead of static checklists. Believe me, you will have people who want to buy a utility if you're looking for a buyer. Just don't go the easy route. Get in charge, get in control, then establish conditions, not just on the transactions, but on the post-merger um, actions, okay? Conditions on the transaction terms. You know, you've got to deal with the control premium and you've got to deal with the debt. Say something ahead of time. Don't have the company come to you and say, here's the deal and if you mess with it, it goes away. Say ahead of time, I don't want to see a control premium higher than X percent above uh, a, a market price and here's why. That's taking a position. Have transaction financing guidelines. I don't want to see debt being used to purchase equity or if it's dead, it's got to be no more than X percent. Or if it's dead, I'm going to I'm not going to give it a, a equity return. Again, people can debate about the pros and cons, but have that vision in advance. Have those conditions in advance, and then system two, effortful thinking. Create filing requirements that force comparisons. You know, one of the oops, what happened there? Excuse me, one second. You don't need to see all that. Come back here. Sorry about that. You just saw all that. Now, have one of the fascinating things that Kahneman, Thaler, and Tversky talked about is the difference between the mental effort between making comparisons and looking at something in isolation. If the only thing before you with the DC Commission is Exelon's proposed acquisition of Pepco, compare that to what if five companies were competing and you had all five proposals? Ah, the mental effort, the creativity that you would force. And the way you would end up thinking about it would be so much richer, so much more beneficial to the public. We don't do that. But if you create filing requirements that force those comparisons between the proposals and your vision, you're going to learn so much more. You're going to demand so much more. You're going to be regulating for performance. Remember, you have to substitute for competitive forces because in a monopoly merger, you don't have competitive forces. All right then the infrastructure of regulation. We need to strengthen our resources, our powers, and we have to assess prior mergers effects. Okay, regulatory resources. Yes, we should have a team of people within each state commission who are experts in mergers, in their financing, in their competitive effects, in their accounting, in their legal rights and obligations. We have to clarify statutory powers. There's a case, this goes back many years, um, in the in the main state of Maine Supreme Court, that says um, we uh, a commission does not have the power to order mergers. I've disagreed in the book with that uh, with, with that uh, statutory interpretation by the court, but it's the law. And I think most commissioners, you ask them, could they order mergers? Uh, they'd probably say no. If you ask the lawyers to analyze the statute, uh, you'd probably get a breakdown. You know, some would be for, some would be against. But why? Why argue about it? Why not go to the legislature and say, give me the authority to make sure the best mergers happen? And then, Carl, to go back to an earlier question, um, because nobody has evaluated a single one of these mergers, let alone all 80 of them, let's organize a multi-jurisdictional, multidisciplinary evaluation of the last 30 years before we have any more. Because we will get to a point, and those of you of a certain age, uh, might remember a 1966, uh, well, I was pretty young then myself, but my dad would always chuckle at Art Buckwald's columns. And Art Buckwald wrote a column during the merger mania of the 60s saying there's only two companies left, the Samson Company and the Delilah Company. And he writes a column about how the CEO of the two companies, the only two companies left because they owned all every other single company. They get together for lunch and they say, hey, why don't we merge? We'll help everybody. Isn't that the American way? All right, Hempling is exaggerating. Well, just hold on. Where does it end? Where do we reach the point where we have too many mergers? And wouldn't it be better to figure that out now rather than wait for it all to happen? Carl, with that, again, my deepest appreciation for what you do at NRI and for NRI's mission. And I'm happy to take, um, we've got whatever time left, looks to me like 15 minutes uh, to take questions. Back to you, Carl. That's great. Uh, Scott, we've, we've had um, a lot of uh, questions on, uh, I, I know that you've been working on electric primarily, but it seems as if a lot of what you've been discussing today is somewhat applicable to the water industry. 
where there have been mergers, there are incentive, financial incentives uh, in terms of rate making practices to encourage mergers in particular with uh, small water companies. Do you have any thoughts on mergers in water companies? I do. Um, thank you, Carl. <clears throat> Again, I, I focused the book on electricity because that's my, um, that's what I have focused on in my career and I know the companies better. Um, I, 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 I will um, tentatively suggest that most of the principles, if not all of them, in the book could apply to other um, industries. And I hope people could read the book with that um, transferability in mind. And I did write an essay. I write a monthly essay and uh, back about a year ago, I had an excellent conversation with our, a gentleman named Richard Rauschmeier. Um, he's on the um, California Public Advocates staff and uh, just a very, very smart fellow. And we talked about water mergers and that inspired me to write this thousand word um, essay. So if somebody's interested, I can send that to them. They can find it uh, uh, on Google or on my website. Um, here's, here's, again, I don't want to pose as a water expert. I will argue here, though, that absent, again, that concept of vision, we won't get the right mergers. My understanding about water is that there is a need to consolidate. There is an, econ an economies of scale problem. There is a resource insufficiency problem, both in terms of technical ability and financial uh, clout. There is a need to spend big dollars uh, on these uh, water systems. Um, there is a need to find a way to reduce consumption because population grows, but water is fixed. There's every reason to think about what is the right collection of companies. So I applaud those who are thinking about mergers, um, but I will argue that what I loosely understand the situation to be, which is like electricity, where the mergers are opportunistic, that you don't have a state commission waking up saying, okay, we need to create a plan for consolidation that puts cost effectiveness and customer benefits first. We need to figure out a way to attract the best performers. What I understand about the acquisitions in water is that they're still based on highest price, and sometimes where the, uh, it's a municipality that's selling the water company, well, they're using the, um, the acquisition cost. They want a high price. They want a high price because they can uh, build a swimming pool or build a, uh, a tennis court or lower taxes. And those are legitimate political decisions, but it's not going to get you the best performer. So my argument is the same as it is for electricity that the state commissions aided by state law, if they don't have the state law, should be creating plans. Now, I don't mean that they pull out the magic markers and they start drawing on a map, but they should learn enough about the physical infrastructure to focus on economies of scale. See, electricity, a lot of people think we've exhausted economies of scale many years ago. Water, that's the debate. So again, I guess my, my best advice on water is get your state legislature and commissions to have a plan don't allow it to go the opportunistic route where price rather than performance is the criterion, Carl. Okay, great. Now, um, what authority do you argue commissions have to create uh, for these positions, criteria, plans up front? Uh, and then the, the questioner says, I understand commissions have a broad public interest mandate, but seems like a stretch Paren, open to legal challenges, close paren, to go from that to saying a specific location of the buying entity is included or excluded in criteria up front versus part of the final rationale. Yeah, uh, excellent. Uh, fair enough. So, you know, that's a legal question and a policy question. And I'll emphasize, you know, I'm not big on litigation. My batting average in the Court of Appeals. Um, well, you know, it ain't bad if it's baseball, but it's not great if you're trying to, uh, you know, show how great you are. I mean, it's below five, it's below 50%. Um, so I, I prefer that we figure out what the right policy is, go to our state legislatures and uh, get the uh, statutes passed. Then we're not going to have any litigation issues, uh, assuming we comply with the Constitution. Um, but I guess I will politely and tentatively disagree um, with the questioner. If the only words that the statute gives you are public interest, I see no bar to a commission saying that our definition of the public interest is in mergers is a transaction whose benefits to customers are at least equal to what would occur in a competitive market. 
So that's on the positive side. That allows them to have a maximized criterion. Now, in terms of the character of the company, I will argue, and I'm an appellate lawyer, and I'm, a, I'm an opinion writer, and, I've, and I'm a statute reader and a law professor, I will argue that as long as the commission has a screen, has, connects its screen to a legitimate, plausible argument of customer harm, it's going to be upheld by the courts. Now, if the commission says it's okay if they come from Spain, but not from Germany, well, that's stupidity. You know, that's not going to be upheld by the court. But if the commission says we need the books to be in English language, okay. Or if, what if a commission, let me make it hard, we don't want anything from Iran because, well, because our nation is almost at war with them. I think a commission could say that. Now, somebody's gonna say they're violating foreign policy, but what I'm getting at, you can have screens that if you trace them to plausible predictions of customer harm, I would argue that you're gonna be well within the public interest uh, standard. So Carl, uh, ready for the next question. It's a great question. So the, the, the next question is a softball for you and, and it's how do people uh, sign up to be able to receive your monthly essay? Uh, well, you can just go to my website and the upper right hand corner is a place to sign and up. And your website is? ScottHemplingLaw.com. Okay, thank you. We had more than one person asking that question. So um, I, I think that's great. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful monthly essay. Um, let me see. Let me, we had one earlier today. Um, at what point does a company get so big and so spread out across the country that there are no economies of scale. And as an economist, I'd say that there are diseconomies of scale. That is, does having a centralized management structure far away from the actual uh, company servicing customers hurt rather than help customers? Well, that, you know, that's, that's the question that I don't have the expertise to answer, but it's the question that nobody has asked. And I think that's the biggest of the many errors that we have in public policy. Um, one, of the, one of the things about that word economies of scale, if I can take a, a little bit longer, Carl, on this question. Please do. Th this, this word gets used like a mantra. I'm telling you, it's a sales job. And I'm going to repeat myself because I know I have people on this, on this call who are going to be skeptical. I do not oppose all mergers. I've signed settlements for mergers. I've advised commissions that approve mergers. I just want the cost effective ones. But this economies of scale concept gets said and repeated and heard by people that first of all, might not be able to define it even in terms of the first week of economics 101, but second of all, fail to specify what they're talking about. Are we talking about economies of scale in generation construction? Are we talking about economies of scale in generation operations? Are we talking of, I won't go down the list, are we talking about economies of scale in shareholder relations? Are we talking about economies of scale in terms of fuel purchasing? What are we talking about in terms of economies of scale? It's a chapter heading in an economics textbook. It is not a specific solution or data point. And so it, but you get people repeating it like that answers the question. There have been no, as far as, well, let me be very careful. I cite some in the book. There have been studies of economies of scale in generation that have argued, this is John Quoka from Northeastern University um, uh, who says we exhausted them a long time ago. That's in generation. And yes, your word diseconomies of scale is correct. There's a point after which management distraction, excess uh, distraction, uh, uh, sorry, excess debt in the holding company structure, um, too many non-related business risks that there is a diseconomy. My, my view is that if I'm a commission and I hear somebody use the word economies of scale, I want to see the definition and I want to see the data. Don't bring me mantras, bring me data. Carl. Well, thank you. And, and just to be clear, in, in I believe that there's a lot of confusion between economies of scale and economies of scope, where when you have economies of scale, you're looking at whether or not a single firm could produce a single good uh, at a lower cost than two or more firms, whereas economies of scope are whether or not it can produce a bundle of goods. 
So I would argue, for example, ISOs have economies of scope, not economies of scale. So I think you're right. And, and Quokka's work is, is wonderful work. And I recommend it to any of those who are uh, interested in economies of scale and economies of scope. Um, the, there's a question here about, um, is your analytical framework that you're presenting or the questions that you're presenting in terms of the investor owned utilities uh, transferable to uh, mergers of co-ops and municipalities and municipal utilities? I think yes in part and no in, in, and no in part. Um, the no in part is this. Um, where I, uh, where I talked in, in chapter one, all the way back, um, you know, an hour and a half ago, about the mergers being motivated by the desire to monetize a franchise, where there's a for-profit interest that in a competitive market can be aligned with the customer interest, but in a non-competitive market is misaligned with the customer interest, that whole foundation for skepticism is inapplicable because the co-ops and the munis are nonprofit companies. Um, the notion of having a vision for the right matchups, I think is applicable, but here's the thing, in the muni and the co-op context, because the owners are the customers, you don't, uh, roughly speaking, um, not purely legally speaking, but practically speaking, the owners are the customers. You don't have the inherent tension between the shareholder interest and the um, customer interest. And so I would argue that it's possible that individual opportunistic decisions by munis and co-ops to merge will not be inconsistent with the public interest, would not be inconsistent. Um, might there be some other coupling that would be better than the one that they come up with? Well, possible, but wouldn't their interest be in finding the best coupling? So I'll, I'll just leave it there. I could disagree with myself tomorrow morning. Um, I think that the, the, the notion of having the, regular, having the infrastructure for thinking, being um, factual about economies of scale, thinking about the long term, um, being multidisciplinary, using system two, Kahneman system two, all apply. But I will admit that much of the analysis um, relates to the for-profit context. And I did make that clear in the opening to the book, Carl. Very good. Let, let's uh, finish with this last question, which I'm going to merge uh, with, with the previous question, which is, with the inevitable change in commission uh, and commission, commissioners and, and staff, uh, composition with differing opinions on visions and uh, positions, policy positions, how or would you recommend a base set of principles? And uh, that ties in with an earlier question that we had and not asked, which is, shouldn't your arrangements be posed to state legislatures to provide M&A vision to commissions, et cetera? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's the very fact that we have such frequent changes in the commissionerships, uh, less so in the staff, but it's the very fact of the uh, frequency of those changes that we should have stability in the policy. In fact, what I think happens is that um, whereas I've been able to observe 85 mergers over these 35 years, your typical commissioner is seeing a merger for the first time right? Because you don't get them all the time in every state. You get rate cases all the time in states. The typical commissioner is seeing their merger for the first time, and they're probably going to go back and see what happened last time, right? Because they're humble. And they're not going to say, let me read Scott Hempling's book and change the way the world works. I've only been on the job two months now. That's just not going to happen. So the notion of going to the state legislatures and having them see uh, more about the long term, um, that, that's a very a good idea. Uh, in any event, the expertise is still with the commission. And so I'm going to stick to my guns and say we should create a multi-state, um, multidisciplinary uh, team and think through these issues. Carl, I lost track of the second half of the question, please. I, I, I wasn't expecting a question back. Uh, 
<laughs> well, uh, well I'll, 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 I think I'll, that you hit it. You know. I'll help us both out so that we can end on a uh, firm, uh, stable, professional note. Um, collaboration among the states, but also between the legislature and the commission. I mean, we are talking about who controls the franchise to provide a service that people depend on for life. It is an inherently political decision, and I mean political in the good way. And so it calls for policymaking by the legislature, advised by the expert commissions. Carl, I want to thank you and uh, the team at NRI again for this uh, opportunity. You've managed it so well uh, with all the preparation uh, so smoothly. And I want to thank the community that I serve and that I worked for for so many years, both for the opportunity to serve during this career and uh, for the chance to speak today, Carl. Um, with that, back to you. Well, thank you so much, Scott. And I, I've got to say that you, you've certainly uh, made it easy on us, uh, just given your professionalism. And I want to thank you again for this provocative and uh, learned talk. Uh, next steps on, on how to, uh, you know, share your insights with respect to mergers. It's obviously a very uh, important subject. And as the industry is going to be changing and transforming in the next few years, uh, one that uh, it's prudent to have uh, what we uh, can know about that subject uh, more readily available. So thank you again. And thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, we look forward to uh, continued participation with you in the regulatory community. And um, please look at the uh, RTI um, uh, channel on YouTube and you can hear uh, both Scott's uh, lecture again and also the uh, lectures in the uh, introduction to the theory and practice of regulation. Please have a good day, stay safe, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, talk with you and, and, and work with you. Good afternoon.